Hey, what's happening guys? Good to see you. Let's talk today about op amps in a plus 5 volt single supply world. <laughs> the reason I want to talk about that is back when op amps, you know, well, back in the 80s, late 80s, when I was learning electronics and I was learning about op amps, we generally used a split supply, generally 15 volts, you know, plus 15 volts and a minus 15 volts. So, you know, if we had you know, something that looked like this. So we had plus 15 volts, we had minus 15 volts, and then right here, you know, this was zero volts. And say we had a, a, just a simple sine wave. You know that we were we were uh, amplifying using say like an LM741 with an inverting amplifier configuration. The most basic thing you can do with an op amp. Well, what you would notice here are a couple of things. This line here was about 12 volts DC, and this line here was about minus 12 volt DC. So what you're seeing here is between the rails, this is the rail here, you know, say we've got a 30 volt differential, but then we come down here, we've only got about a 24 volt differential. And that's because, you know, our basic op amps like the 741 are not what are known as rail to rail op amps they have a little bit of what's called headroom. In the LM741, it can be between like 1.8 and 2.8 volts. We'll just call it 3 volts and go with that. So what is happening is basically this area here is dead to the op amp. The op amp needs those couple of volts to do its business. So let's, uh, let's review real quick the rules of op amps so that we're all on the same page. Now I have an entire op amp playlist and I invite you to take a look at it because I'm not going to get into this very deeply I just want to touch on it. So here's our op amp any old op amp. We have a non-inverting input we have an inverting input we have our output and then we have our positive input our positive power input and a negative power input. So generally, you know, we would put our you know, plus 15 here and our minus 15 here. And that would give us about a 24 volt swing. That's what we call that, the swing of the op amp. Now, our rules are number 1. The op amp has infinite loop gain. That means without something giving it feedback, the op amp will just continue to amplify the signal forever. Rule number two, input impedance is infinite. That means, you know, if you, if you were to take a pseudo actual reading of the resistance of our two inputs, they would just be infinite, you know, millions of mega ohms of, uh, of resistance. Rule number three, no current flows in the inputs. So that's why an op amp makes an excellent buffer. They are voltage operated, not current operated. And rule number four, the op amp will do whatever it can to make the difference, the delta, between the non-inverting 
and the inverting inputs zero. That's what the op-amp does. That's why it is so versatile and so useful. This circuitry in here will do whatever it has to do to make the difference between these two things zero. And whatever it has to do is what is shown out here on the output. Are you with me so far? Good. Now, let's talk about today, 2019. What's that? Well, that, my friends, is a USB power supply with our strange little American 120 volt uh, plugs, non polarized, non grounded, it's plastic, doesn't matter. But this is the ubiquitous power supply that darn near everything these days is powered by. What does that mean when we're talking about op amps? Well, what it means is instead of having that 30 volt swing to play with we now have a 5 volt swing to play with so when you have your cell phone or you know whatever little device you're playing with here you know it's probably powered USB or you know lipo battery whatever but it generally has a single input of a positive DC voltage somewhere around 5 volts. And that starts to make a big difference when we're designing our circuits with op amps. Okay? What we're talking about is our rail to rail. That's our swing that we're talking about here. Now, our standard op amps, again, like the 741 and everything of that ilk, are not what are known as rail-to-rail -rail op amps. They have the headroom that we talked about. But fear not, because there are rail-to-rail -rail op amps. I've got one here. It's a very nice one. Let's pop this out here, and we'll talk about it for just a second. We can uh, zoom in here. All right, can you guys see that in there? Let me see if I can uh, bring it up. Not going to make it any better, is it? No, nope, try. I'm trying to get it to focus. Bear with me. There we go. Hold on, more light. There we go. You guys can see that better now. This is a Texas Instruments TLC 2272CP. This is a uh, rail to rail op amp. And it's a pretty nice one. Whoa, sorry, kind of hard to hold it all in place there. This combines a high slew rate and a high bandwidth, rail to rail output swing, a high input drive, and everything. And one of the benefits of it is it works great with a single supply. So, how can we get it to do that? Well, let me show you. There again, we just have our standard op amp drawing. And the reason I want to talk about this is because these are some important design characteristics you have to take it into account when you're designing circuits in today's modern world with a single supply of, you know, say 5 volts. And the reason that is important are two things that we need to keep into account, and that is our SNR, our signal to noise ratio, and our dynamic range. When we reduce the output or the operating supply from a 15 volt split supply to a single 5 volt supply, we reduce our maximum available dynamic range. Now, the dynamic range is determined by the ratio of the largest output voltage to the smallest output voltage. That makes sense? Say, for instance, you know, our industry standard LM741 is, uh, is specified at 5 volt single supply with, uh, it's over here, LM741. So at 5 volts, it's specified at, I think, 3.8 for the maximum output swing. So, you know, we're losing 1.2 volts. That doesn't sound like much, I know, but think about it in the grand scheme of things.
that is coming out to be about a 31% loss. So, you know, think about that, you know, in, in terms of overall, 31% is a huge loss. We don't want that. You know, the whole supply can't be used for our output swing. That's further reduction of our maximum uh, available dynamic range and our signal to noise ratio goes up because we can't, signal to noise ratio goes down when we can use the whole dynamic range because we're not trying to compress everything. We're, we're using the full range of it available. So that's why when you're doing designs like this, you want to use uh, something that has a maximum available rail to rail output swing. Another important thing that we need to talk about here is what's called slew rate. Okay, the slew rate of the output stage is the measure for the maximum possible voltage rise and fall speed, which is the change during a period of time. And we can figure out our slew rate with this formula. Slew rate is equal to 2 pi sub max times V sub P. So say for instance um, our max is 5 volts, right? So our slew rate would be 2 pi sub 5 times our max, which in this case is about 4.9 uh, sub P. So our slew rate decreases proportionally with the possible voltage level. I know there's a lot to keep in mind there, but basically just think about it like this. So we're going we're gonna to use this as, say, um, a simple inverting amplifier. So we take a voltage divider from our positive rail here at 5 volts, say this is 10k and this is 10k, and we take that into our positive, we ground that, this goes up here, then we have input and then we come back here with our inverting amplifier, boom, that's our simple inverting amplifier circuit. We want to get that maximum available dynamic range with the minimum available signal to noise ratio and a maximum available slew rate. These are the things that keep engineers up when you're trying to fit all this in. So all of this jibber jabber, let's put it to a useful demonstration, okay? Boom. Here's a simple circuit. That is using that uh, 2772. And this is simply a square wave, or a sort of square wave oscillator. And it should give us as close to 5 volts peak to peak as we can. Let me draw the circuit for you real quick, okay? Okay, here's our simple, simple circuit. It's just an op amp oscillator. I'm not going to get into how it works. Our timing is controlled basically by the charging and discharging of this 68 puff uh, capacitor, which is right here. We have a 10K voltage divider here. This giving us a two and a half volt uh, input here into our non-inverting input, which is also feeding back from our output. We're taking our output and we're feeding it back and we're mixing it with that right there and that's giving us our oscillation so let's hook it up now keep in mind nothing is ever perfect so we're not going to see a perfect square wave because we have a capacitor charging and discharging we should see somewhere around four and a half volts we might see that we might see higher we might see lower ain't nothing perfect in the world because of design tolerances on our resistors on our capacitors and all of that 
loveliness. All right, let's get her hook, hook, and hook it up there, and we'll swing up here and take a look. Let me fix this screen. That's not too bad. Bring in our measure window here, and you can see. All right, here's our waveform again. Because of the charging and discharging the capacitor, we're not getting a, a straight square wave. What we are getting is a 53 kilohertz somewhat square wave with a mean voltage of 5.12 and our peak to peak is 4 volts. So we're losing still 10%. But can you imagine if you did that same circuit with an LM741 and you're losing 31% out of your 5 volt total input? You know, you might get 2.7 volts of swing. And that's the main thing that I wanted to cover here today. Now, let's take a look at... Uh, get in here. Take a look at time. We'll come in here and we'll look at this rise time. So our rise time on this is 3.8 microseconds. And our fall time is pretty much the same. So our slew rate, 3.8 and 3.8, we're doing okay. We tried to run this again on something like a 741, you know, it would be terrible. Is that enough of a rise time uh, to act as an edge and trigger digital circuitry? Mm, probably. If it's not, you know, run it through something like a Schmidt trigger and pop yourself out a square edge. Whew. All right. I hope that I've made enough sense for you today and what I'm trying to say is simply when you're designing op amp circuits in a 5 volt single supply world you just have to be more mindful of your slew rate and your rail to rail voltages it ain't like the 15 volt plus 15 volt negative days of the past okay all right, I think that's enough for today. You got questions, put them down below. Don't forget to like, share, comment, whatever. <laughs> and uh, thank you guys for watching. Big thanks to the patrons for supporting this channel. That's it. I'm out. Peace.